this week. Another blast from the past. To Deutschland. Carl Zeiss Siena. A couple vintage samples. They're actually the same lens. The Carl Zeiss Siena Tessar. 50 millimeter 2.8. One from 1955, one from 1978. That's quite an age difference, yeah? Which one's actually better? You might be surprised. Oh, this shiny little bling bling here. Bling, bling. Looks nice, right? Well, this black sleek little mother here also has a reputation. So let's get into it and see what the differences are. See if they're the same or see if they're not. All right, so. Pull up a chair and uh, we'll get into it. Here I am, BNM. Green is always coming down. Well, this is Camera Talk with Dr. Scott. Okay, this week, just like the intro said, we're going to be taking a look at uh, a couple of Carl Zeiss uh, lenses. They're actually the same lens as I already mentioned, the, uh, the Tessar. 50 millimeter, 2.8. And I'll talk about, you know, one thing, they, they had their heyday and everything, but in today's world, you know, a lot of people are getting into vintage lenses and whatnot, uh, realizing, you know, just because they're 50, 60, 70 year old lenses, uh, you know, doesn't mean that, you know, like a lot of old things, oh, they don't work very well. They actually produce some pretty stunning results. Okay. So, and if you want an example of a good bang for your buck, the Carl Zeiss uh, uh, Tessars are a great example of that. I mean, you can pick them up for like 50 bucks. 50 bucks! You know, try doing that with a modern, modern lens and uh, see where that gets you. Um, you know, we talked about that with my, my little plastic fantastic 35mm from Yungyo or whatever their name is. Ancient Chinese secret. Um, you get what you pay for. But these guys, you know, these guys were manufactured to perform and perform they do, especially for the bang for the buck. Now, again, if they were like $500 lenses on eBay or something like that, you might, you know, after using them after a while, you might say, oh, I think I got ripped off with this. But for 50 bucks, again, you're gonna do, you're gonna end up well. So let me talk about these real quick. Starting with uh, the older one, um, you know, again, it, it's Carl Zeiss Jena, which is uh, East at the time was East Germany. Now it's all one big unified country again. Yeah. But, um, you know, after World War II, you know, when the com uh, country was split in, split in half uh, as part of war reparations, you know, the Soviet Union, which is today Russia, uh, took over Eastern Germany and the town of Jena, uh, where Carl's Ice factory was located, you know, fell within their part of Germany. So, you know, uh, you know, they controlled the, they controlled uh, everything going on in the in the eastern part anyway. Um, but Carl's Ice also opened a factory uh, in West Germany, and so they were kind of working in parallel with each other. But these two both were um, were produced in uh, Jena, so they're they're East German. But, uh, again, the technicians, the, the equipment, the, the, the plans, the drawings, the history, everything was in Jena. So, um, you know, as much as you, know, you may look at, at uh, Soviet manufacturing practices as being a little, uh, a little lackadaisical. Um, you know, the Germans still produced with pride and they produced some pretty excellent lenses in their day. So again, this is the Tessar and now it has a, you know, a long history before the Soviets ever got involved, um, you know, with running the government on that side of the, that side of the wall. But, um, you know, back in 1902, uh, Dr. Paul Rudolph, working for Carl Zeiss, designed this um, design, this lens. And it's, you know, also kind of known as a modified cook triplet. Um, you know, it's one thing they, they comment, like I said, they're, they're both the same lenses, even though physically they're very different. 
but you know they both have four elements and three groups um, but that's actually kind of where they leave off the mounts are the same m42 mounts a screw mount um, you know the, the the actual design of how the the body and the lenses go together are again both similar there the uh, front element is is set deep in into the body so the the body kind of acts like a like a hood um, without having to buy one because they're so inset um, that they kind of block any kind of uh, sunlight and whatnot getting in without having to having to install a hood but anyway uh, when dr. Rudolph designed this originally it was an f6.3 uh, you know again this is 120 years ago um, you know so that was that was still killer technology at the time you know it was like wow what a killer lens uh, and then five years later um, you know he reduced to that to 4.5 you know he tweaked tweaked some of the uh, the elements a little here and there and uh, by 1930 we ended up with kind of the final result and they made two versions uh, they made an f3.5 and the f2.8 which is uh, which is this one now the the Tessar itself yeah, yeah as I showing you I have two models they made five or six different models altogether can't remember exactly how many but it's either five or six um, uh, each one you know it, it, it had its features to it but they were all still exactly the same um, uh, formula as far as lens you know manufacturing went and uh, you know this particular one here the silver um, edition was uh, um, made for I don't know, six or seven years maybe even ten years you know if you don't remember exactly but um, you know some of the uh, the benefits or the features of this particular model here uh, was aperture blades for one you know this one has 12 they made as many as 14 or they made models with as many as 14 blades which as you know especially curved blades make for very nice rounded bokeh balls you know from wide open all the way down to f16 um, you know because of the when the aperture closes down they maintain that that round uh, opening and um, the other the other thing too is when they started using coatings uh, the Tessars come with or without coating this one has single coating because it has a single T without the asterisk which is multi coating so the, the red T uh, which again differentiating East and West Germany the, the East Germans use the red T the West Germans use the red V um, to indicate um, coating on their lenses um, you know the other thing with the silver model here is it's a preset um, see the uh, and of course you, from the distance you probably can't see but um, the aperture ring you could pull it down and you know preset it to whatever aperture you intend to shoot at and you know again with today's you know technology with digital cameras and mirrorless cameras or whatnot you know we use focus peaking or magnification and other things so um, it's designed you know on SLRs to see through the lens to see what you're what you're focusing in on um, and then later because you preset your let's say your your aperture for f uh, 5.6 you just turn your aperture ring and it'll stop at 5.6 it won't go any further because you preset it for that so that's what you take your photo at but you focus in and you know get the right exposure uh, dialed in um, wide open and so that's what presets all about and again it's outdated in today's world we don't we don't use it but that's again the difference between like this one and, and this one this model doesn't have that feature um, you know again they all, they all come with um, uh, with distance indicators here for zone focusing and, and whatnot um, you know again this is 1955 this is 10 years before I was born and I'm an old guy so but look how look how buttery smooth that is um, you know that's fine craftsmanship right there 
And, you know, again, because it's an all aluminum body, um, you know, it's not very heavy. It's only 170, 100, uh, no, 175 grams versus the, uh, versus, uh, the later model, which is got a little more plastic involved. That's 100 and 170 grams, so five grams more, even though, again, it's a smaller, uh, smaller lens, but it's a five grams, five grams heavier because of the, all the metal. Um, what else? Uh, you know, again, the, you know, the quality um, in these lenses, originally this thing was nicknamed the Eagle's Eye because of how sharp it is, you know, from F4 down uh, to wide open, eh, it's kind of soft. I mean, they, they, they still, you know, render sharp enough, uh, especially close, because the close focus distance on these guys is 35 centimeters, which is a foot for uh, those in the Imperial system. Um, but again, it's, uh, you know, and I'll show you some, some samples, and I, you know, as usual, I picked Dylan, uh, my son, who just turned 17 months uh, last week. Uh, I also talked my wife into getting, uh, getting involved in uh, being a model for me too. So we get the pleasure of having Dylan and Amy in the, uh, the, same, the same pictures today. So um, anyway, so I'll give you some, some samples at uh, f2.8. And as I said, from F4 up to F16, that's where the eagle's eye um, comes in. And of course, it's translated from a German, uh, German nickname, to which I've forgotten uh, how to say that, but I'll put that up here. Uh, and Tessar itself actually is a derivative of a Greek word for four, because there's four elements, uh, which is tesser. Um, so it's... T-E-S-S-E-R instead of A-R. But anyway, um, you know, it's got great contrast, great color. Uh, the bokeh is okay. Um, it's not exactly what this lens is famous for, but it's, it's okay. Uh, nothing to really complain about. And, you know, it was rumored that the, um, um, the lights or Leica, as it's known today, but you know, back in the day, lights um, was Carl Zeiss's um, really main competitor uh, in in uh, photography, and uh, Max Barrick tried a Tessar and agreed that it was a nice lens, you know, uh, sharp enough, and you know, he just liked you know everything about it, but. This lens originally was designed for an 18 by 24, which was the, the film frame size back in the day. Um, and, you know, whether you know it or not, you know, Leica was the one who designed the, you know, the first handheld camera um, with a 24 by 36 millimeter um, size film. And that's where the standard came in. Uh, everybody copied that after, so therefore the 18 by 24 kind of went the way of the dinosaur, and the 24 by 36 is actually the size of all your full-frame sensors these days. So Leica was the uh, the groundbreaker in not only handheld cameras but also in the size of the film that was used, which translated into the size of a full-frame sensor these days for the mirrorless uh, cameras that that we use. So. Um, you know, the 50 millimeter 3.5 Elmer, uh, Elmar by, uh, lights or Leica, uh, is not a copy of this as much as people may think. Plus the Elmar also had five elements in three groups, but anyway, so no copying involved. They, the actual copying that happened with this, um, was my, my, uh, Indistar 61 which is, uh, again, a Soviet copy of the Tessar. Um, you know, it's a straight up, straight up copy, exact same uh, optical formula and everything. Um, so anyway, that was pretty much everything I could think of anyway to do with, with the Tessar. Um, so let me show you some samples of using 
uh, this. So I'm going to start with the uh, the older one first. Obviously, uh, you know we'll go with we'll go with the one here from 1955. Uh, so let me screw this onto the end of my Canon or Canon. Sony Sony fanboys out there are going Canon. The Sony A7R2, um, and what I usually do is focus in on the end of my. Now this time I have Canon, my Canon M50, which is recording this uh, this video. So what I do is I focus in on the uh, on the nameplate on the end of the, the little kit lens, the 15 to 45, and uh, we see how how sharp we, we can get it. Now of course I always shoot wide open just to show you the uh, capabilities of the of the lens so i'm going to focus in as best i can and of course i went the wrong way duh all right so let me find the sweet spot and which is right there one two three all right so that was the Tessar 1955 version uh, and let me show you using this lens some shots of Dylan and Amy and also just to show you various, you know, because obviously in lockdown, I can't go outside and take pictures of palm trees and, and the river across the street in my university campus, which is across the river on the other side as well, because, you know, we're locked down. We can't go anywhere. So I'm going to show you some other photos of landscapes and architecture and stuff like that, just to show you again what, what this particular lens can do. So that was, again, the 1955 uh, version. As you can see, it's a M42 screw mount. So it just screws on and off the, uh, on and off the uh, adapter. And the adapter is nothing special. Um, I don't believe in spending hundreds of dollars on fancy name brand adapters. So um, this particular one, I mean, I do have K&F adapter for some but this one's just a no name made in china uh adapter um uh, because again as long as it has the lip in there for the pin um of course I got it on there before i can show you that um you know in this model you know in the 1979 model we have a automatic and manual switch on here for again for the aperture on the old slr cameras so there's a pin that needs to be um, depressed in order for the the aperture to spring out when you're when you're in in uh, automatic mode. But because we don't use that, um, it doesn't matter. But the adapter has to have a, that little lip on the inside to be able to push the pin up as you're as you're installing it. But again, I don't I don't use that, so it doesn't doesn't apply to me. Um, all right, so this is, uh, make sure again, I'm in 2.8. Um, so this is the 1978 uh, model of the Tessar 50 millimeter 2.8. And, you know, again, it's metal, but it's also a little plasticky. Um, the, uh, I mean, it, it, it has, still has plenty of metal on it, don't get me wrong. Uh, but it just has more plastic than the older model, which has really besides the faceplate, I guess, um, doesn't have much plastic at all. But, um, you know, a lot of people will say that the older or the newer model of the Tessar is not quite the same quality. And as I said, the aperture blades, you only have five. So you have 12 here and five here. 
So what do you think the boca is going to look like? Or the boca balls, anyway. You know, it's wide open, they'll be round, of course, but as soon as you stop down, you're going to start seeing the Ninja Star um, situation happening. So, um, as I said, let me, uh, let me focus in on the end of the end of the uh, M50's kit lens here just so I can show you the difference and all right there's a sweet spot one two three and to be honest with you just looking through this is pretty tough to tell the difference on these as I said some people will say the quality on the uh, on the newer lens is not as good um, you know again the rumors about the you know, about the East German quality control started to go downhill as, you know, as the Soviets were running the country. But again, a company is a company. You know, people take pride in their jobs and everything just because the Soviets are running the government doesn't mean everybody all of a sudden turns into an East Bloc, you know. <laughs> trying to think of something nice, nice way to put it. Um, but anyway, that is... The shot of the lens, here's the shot of uh, Dylan and Amy. And here's some shots again of, you know, other random stuff using, uh, using this uh, vintage uh, lens here. And that was pretty much everything I wanted to say about the uh, Carl Zeiss uh, Tessar 50 millimeter 2.8 um, again very very nice lens for what you get economically like I said about 50 bucks you can get them cheaper maybe you spend a little more um, you know, if you're on eBay and somebody's trying to sell something like this for a couple hundred dollars to you, keep moving um, because you can get them pretty cheap. And again, this is a very good quality lens for, you know, something 1955. Um, you know, that's you know, 65, 65 year old lens. The quality of this thing speaks for itself. So um, again. Get yourself one. I mean, they're, they're so cheap, get yourself a handful of them. Uh, because, again, the variation between samples may be such that, you know, it was abused, maybe it was dropped or and whatnot. So maybe, uh, you know, lens may be off-centered or decentered. So you have to worry about that kind of thing. But anyway, um, so that was the Carl Zeiss Tessar 50mm 2.8. And it was brought to you by Modesty Photography, where we're here to save you money show you some tips on photography, introduce you to some vintage lenses and maybe some stuff that you may not have heard of before. Uh, if you have, it's a good refresher for you, right? Um, so anyway, um, what else I want to tell you? How about, uh, are you using any software to, uh, to uh, edit your photos? Well, I use Luminar, uh, Luminar AI soon to sign up uh actually i already bought the the latest greatest version called the uh, luminar neo uh you know if you buy it before you know the early bird price is like 35 bucks or something so again it's not that expensive but you buy them they're yours for life so i've got i've got luminar 4 i've got luminar ai and then i'll have luminar neo that i buy them and i can you know load them on my computers and you know, again, use them independently. You don't have to worry about, uh, you know, paying monthly fees or anything like that. And they do the same types of things as, as, as like Lightroom and Capture One and uh, uh, Photoshop and, 
you know, all the other ones that are out there. So um, anyway, they're good bang for your buck again. You know, anything, anything, you know, 80 or 90 bucks for a, a software that's yours for life is, is pretty good. And if you click below, I'll give you a $10 discount, um, you know, if you follow my link. And who doesn't like to save a, save a little bit of money? You talking to me? You talking to me? Uh, a little bit of kickback for me. Hey, why not? Dr. Scott likes a little, likes to make a little money on the side as well. So do me a favor. And while you're at it, subscribe. That's right. It doesn't cost you anything then. That's, what, that's a freebie, right? So subscribe. And if you've got a couple logins, why not do it again? Give me a couple different subscriptions, right? So subscribe. And as the algorithm goes here at uh, YouTube, they like the thumbs up or the likes. So give me a like while you're at it, even if you hate the video. I mean, if you're watching this far into it, there must be something in there that's capturing your interest. So give me a like. Uh, doesn't, doesn't cost you anything. And I get to show off the thumbs up girls. Everybody loves the thumbs up girls. I don't know if everybody does. I like him. I don't know if my wife likes them. She hasn't really watched them though. She doesn't watch my videos. Whew, I guess she's a, uh, well, she is a subscriber though. Cause I know my son seems to find my videos on his, uh, well, it's not his, it's my wife's cell phone, but he goes on YouTube and he seems to find my videos and leaves strange comments to which uh, I've actually had to block my wife's subscription for leaving comments because he was just leaving gibberish. I mean, remember he's 17 months, not even a year and a half old yet. So, uh, I'm surprised he even knows how to do this kind of stuff. But, but anyway, uh, thanks for dropping by. You know, this was camera talk with Dr. Scott and, uh, thanks for dropping by. Stay safe out there. It's a nasty COVID world. Um, you know, living with, uh, living with the virus. I think it's, going to move from pandemic to endemic and the near future anyway. So it's going to be with us for a long time. So play safe out there. Do what's, uh, do what's best for you and your family and, uh, come on back next week, right? Because you belong here. That's right. You belong here at camera talk. So have a great week. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. Here I am, B-A-M Green is always